Tonight is red tape at the border keeping tourists away from Canada. A lot of work. It's a complicated process. What's set to change tomorrow and what isn't? Also tonight, heat on the streets. We were halfway done the race and it finally was called off. Dangerous conditions in Manitoba. On pole on the front row here in Montreal. A showdown in Montreal. And seeking accountability for childhood trust betrayed. I don't think there's a day that goes by that you don't remember. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. A COVID restriction Canadians have lived with since last year is being lifted starting tomorrow. Travelers within the country can board a plane without proof of vaccination. But for those coming into Canada, one hurdle remains. The Arrive Can app and everything that comes with it. A questionnaire, proof of vaccination or else mandatory quarantine. Tally Ricci shows us that for those who depend on tourism, it's more than an inconvenience. Warmer weather and weekend foot traffic have returned. But for specialty shops like this one in Niagara Falls, things aren't quite back to normal. I think we have to take a little more step to make it easier to come in and out that will help the whole entire tourism in Niagara region. According to this business owner, what's still missing are the American tourists. In the border, there were some challenges with the Arrive uh, Canada application. Tourism is the lifeblood of border cities like this, and to get it fully flowing again, mayors are calling for the Arrive Can app to be scrapped. But the transportation minister says the app will stick around for now. We continue to have a vaccination requirement for international travelers, and this is a tool to ensure that the, that the, the passenger has the documents required. The government recently dropped a number of travel health measures, but filling out this app and providing the address of a place a traveler could quarantine remains in place. The mayor of Niagara Falls says the extra red tape is threatening their economy. Between July 1st and Labor Day is when we make 80% of our revenue. And unfortunately, the messaging going back in the US right now is that it's very difficult to get into Canada and a lot of people are making the choice to not come. Those who did still come say losing the extra step would have saved them time. A lot of work. It's a complicated process. I wish it was um, just come in and go without all these, you know, these hoops that you have to jump through. The CBSA says it plans to add customs declarations to the Arrive Can app. This tourism expert says in the meantime, it should be paused. It's just causing lots and lots of delays and um, a lot of frustration for people who are trying to go back and forth across our border. And businesses say potentially stopping people like this from paying us a visit. I love this place. It's beautiful. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Niagara Falls, Ontario. Travel snags aren't restricted to Canada. More than 1,000 flights out of the U.S. were cancelled over the weekend. Thousands more delayed. My first flight was delayed more than two hours. They didn't tell them why it was cancelled, but they cancelled everybody's flight. We had people that were in front of us and behind us trying to rebook, and they had no options either. A surge in demand coupled with a shortage of staff have stranded travellers and upended plans. The U.S. Transportation Secretary has urged airline executives to take steps to avoid massive travel disruptions ahead of the July 4th holiday weekend. As Canadians get ready for summer road trips, everyone knows they'll be paying a lot more at the pump. Take a look at the average national gas price one year ago today, sitting at just over $1.30 a litre. But fast forward a year and what a difference. That number now above $2.00. The high cost of fuel isn't just an issue for those paying at the pumps. As David Thurton explains, it's helping the opposition press the government when it comes to inflation. Across the country, drivers are feeling the strain. It does impact a lot the, like, the budget. It's just like now you have to think about it. He's not the only one. It takes money away from, from other stuff, correct? You cannot spend it somewhere else. We count every, uh, every trip we make. You know, we, we go out less. For months, the Conservatives have called for a pause on the GST the government collects each time drivers fuel up. We need Mr. Trudeau and, and Christia Freeland to start spending more time thinking about Canadian families rather than for them. Give them a break at the pumps. Conservatives say this could save Canadians as much as 8 cents a litre. They also point to provinces like Alberta, 
it introduced a provincial fuel tax holiday and inflation fell. The NDP wants the government to support low-income families through rebates and benefits and tax Big Oil's record profits. That profit is an obscene level. We need to put a limit on it, tax some of it, and return it to Canadian taxpayers. The finance minister acknowledged gas prices are a concern, but has not said what the federal government will do. I didn't come here today to announce new measures. Um, we are very much leaving the door open to further action. Freeland's U.S. counterpart says the Biden administration is prepared to go further. President Biden wants to do anything he possibly can to um, help consumers. Gas prices have risen a great deal, and it's clearly burdening households. Yellen says the U.S. is considering a federal gas tax holiday, and while it's unclear if Canada will do the same, Freeland and Yellen are meeting in Toronto on Monday, and affordability is on the agenda. David Thurton, CBC News, Gatineau. We have an update tonight on a horrific attack on a Toronto City bus. Police say they're now investigating it as a possible hate crime. Uh, we have a 33-year-old man under arrest. Uh, that person has been identified as Tenzin Norbu of Toronto. The attack happened Friday in the city's West End. Toronto police say a man poured flammable liquid on a female bus passenger and lit her on fire. She remains in hospital in critical condition with severe burns. The suspect is set to appear in court tomorrow. He now faces several charges, including attempted murder. Ottawa wants to know how Hockey Canada settled a lawsuit over an alleged gang sexual assault. The parliamentary hearing is tomorrow, but CBC News got an exclusive look at the organization's books. Jonathan Gatehouse reveals what's there. There are some numbers that Hockey Canada is eager to share with the public, like the 385,000 registered players across the country. But when it comes to more sensitive figures, like revenues and taxpayer funding, it divulges few, if any, details. Financial statements obtained by CBC News pull back that veil showing that Hockey Canada received $14 million from Ottawa in the past two fiscal years, including $3.4 million in emergency COVID wage and rent subsidies, helping the not-for-profit organization to a $13.5 million budget surplus last year, adding to a war chest of stocks, bonds and cash now worth more than $153 million, while paying no income tax. Public and political outrage over the alleged 2018 sexual assault by players who attended a Hockey Canada gala in London, Ontario, is driving Monday's hearings, as well as a federal audit of the organization's books. Hockey Canada didn't respond to a CBC News request for an interview or to written questions about its finances. This expert on sport and public policy says Canadians deserve more transparency from those who run the national game. They owe an account, a reporting uh, of, of what happened and in the light of the parliamentary inquiry, uh, an account of how that settlement was paid out. Jennifer speaking. Jennifer Dunn heads the abused women's centre in London. She says there was already ample evidence that hockey's culture needs to change. There's like a locker room mentality where it's almost as if these young guys are essentially brought up with no value for a woman's life. And while Dunn understands the focus on public funds, there's another number she wants people to keep in mind. Every 17 minutes in Canada, a woman is sexually assaulted. Hockey Canada needs to pay attention to that. There will be an element of theatre to tomorrow's hearings, because the likely answer about where the settlement money came from is on plain display. There are references to sexual misconduct liability insurance in Hockey Canada's annual reports, a pricey hedge according to financial statements. The organization pays more than $9 million for all types of insurance each and every year. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. In Montreal today, the Canadian Grand Prix was back for the first time since the pandemic began. 20 of the world's best Formula One drivers took to the track. Matt Demore now with the race and a city ready to embrace it. Lindsay Young got to the track early. We drove all the way from Ohio um, and we have grand, our general admission passes so we wanted to be the first ones here so that we could choose our seats. 
Hours later, she and tens of thousands of other F1 fans got the moment they'd waited for. The Canadian Grand Prix returns to the Formula One calendar. It's lights out and away we go. Grand Prix weekend finally back in Montreal. While it's busy down at the racetrack, it's the same story here in downtown Montreal, where race fans and owners of hotels, bars, restaurants and shops have been gearing up for a very busy weekend. Bartender Dave Lanamitz poured drinks for a packed house ready to celebrate. It was to the point where you've got lineups down the street, the phone's ringing off the hook, everyone's Everyone's in a great mood though, so it's really, really nice to see. Even the staff is excited just for the, the aspect of being this busy again. The Grand Prix brings in millions of dollars to the economy, with about half of the visitors coming from outside Quebec. Great news for COVID-weary and labor-strapped shops, restaurants, bars, and of course, hotels. Uh, our staff work, you know, longer hours. Some of our hotel were like 100% booked. The average uh, booking rates or the occupation rate is 96, 97%. There was plenty for visitors to do downtown, including a tire changing practice station. People can even try out a simulator to see how they would do on the track. I'm pretty good at this. But the main draw was the real race and the heart-pumping finish. He sees the checkered flag and will know what it's like to win the Canadian Grand Prix. Reigning world champion Max Verstappen made the best of his pole position advantage, capping off this comeback weekend with a first-place finish. Matt Demel, CBC News, Montreal. An unwelcome scramble last night for 53 families in Quebec's Saguenay region. They're the latest to be ordered out of their homes in a neighborhood where a landslide struck on Monday and swept away an emptied out house. 24 families were ordered to leave initially. Officials say conditions are dangerously similar to what they were in a nearby community back in 1971 when a landslide killed 31 people. The current evacuation order could last weeks, even months. Sweltering heat today in Manitoba, some of it spilling into neighboring provinces. In Winnipeg, the high temperatures forced the cancellation of a marathon while it was being run. Peggy Lamb shows us that and other ways this sun is getting in the way of fun. A strong start today for runners in the Manitoba Marathon, their first event held in person since 2019. But around 90 minutes into the race, when the temperature climbed past 30 degrees, organizers had to cancel the event. It's a terrible decision to have to make. Uh, but that's why it's my job, right? It's my job to keep people safe. It's my job to uh, make sure that we all make good decisions on race days. Some of us don't because we put in all of those, those months of training. We were halfway done the race and it finally was called off. The police marshal said it was over. So it was sort of sad, disappointing. But some marathoners did continue to the finish line. It was probably the hardest race I've ever run. Um, at seven miles, I actually started I was about to drop out. I started walking. Southeastern Saskatchewan and Northwestern Ontario are also feeling the scorch, with temperatures hitting above 30. In Manitoba, humidex levels have reached above 40. And yet, despite how hot and humid it is here, some people are still determined to enjoy the outdoors. At this park, Winnipeggers are under the sun celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day at an outdoor concert. But the heat did lower the turnout. Disappointed a little, but I mean, what can you do about the weather? You mean, people want to stay inside because it's so hot. I mean, so I, I respect it. <laughs> it's okay. It's unfortunate that it's been such a hot day, but at least some people have come out uh, to enjoy everything, and they've done such a nice job, especially for the performers. The heat is expected to stick around until Tuesday, hitting a high of 30 degrees on Monday, but after that, people here should feel some relief. Peggy Lamb, CBC News, Winnipeg. At least 25 people are dead after major flooding in northeastern Bangladesh over the weekend. Millions of people have been left without homes in low-lying parts of the country. Those were hit by the worst monsoon floods in decades. Over 100,000 people have fled, but officials say more than 4 million remain stranded. Army personnel are assisting with search and rescue. Startling reports today of mass killings in Ethiopia's Oromia region. Over 200 members of the Amhara ethnic group are believed dead. 
Witnesses and the regional government blame a rebel group known as the Oromo Liberation Army. It wants to break away from Ethiopia, which is already fighting against separatist rebels in the Tigray region of the country. The head of NATO said that the war in Ukraine could last years, and the chief of UK's army said the British should be prepared to fight a land war with Russia. Just two Western officials echoing Ukraine's call to drive Russia out. We will retake everything, declared the Ukrainian president after a visit to the front lines in the south. At a funeral for well-known activist turned soldier, Kyiv's mayor was also defiant. Be ready to talk with Russians about some compromise if last Russian soldier left Ukraine. A call is backed up by Western weapons, but an advisor to Ukraine's defense minister told Rosemary Barton Live they are still outgunned. We need more heavy weaponry. We need more long-range artillery. We need more air defense systems. We need more tanks, and we need them fast. Civilians continue to flee Ukraine's east, the reality written on their faces. Shelling, it's very scary, she says. We decided to leave. Russia's invasion reducing the region to ruins. Oscar-winning Canadian screenwriter and director Paul Haggis has reportedly been arrested in Italy. According to multiple media reports, Haggis is facing allegations that he sexually assaulted a young woman during a two-day time period. In a statement, Haggis' lawyer said Italian law forbids them from discussing the evidence, but they are confident the allegations against him will be dismissed. As debate continues over the fairness of transgender women participating in women's sports, a major move from the global body governing competitive swimming. Chris Glover has the details. Thomas pulling away over the Just months after trans trailblazer Leah Thomas made history in the pool. Thomas wins the NCAA championship. The first transgender woman to win an NCAA Division I female title is learning her goal of competing in the women's category at the Olympics won't happen. Very important moment for us. Swimming's world governing body voting today to look at creating a new category to include trans women. It is a policy that is based on science. Starting Monday, transgender competitors in women's races must have completed their transition by the age of 12. That's the time at which males really cement their advantage. Developmental biologist Emma Hilton says puberty brings a surge of testosterone for males that medications later on cannot even out. So these small changes that happen to transgender women when they suppress testosterone aren't enough to uh, create kind of equality with the female body. Some fear the rule may unduly accelerate important decisions. The fact that individuals have to um, transition before that point, which is not always typical for children to transition that early. But multiple female Olympic medalists race to call this a positive step. Prioritizing the competitive cornerstone of fairness. However, it is also my hope that a young, gender-diverse child can walk into a swimming club and feel the same level of acceptance. Queer sports advocates condemned the decision as discriminatory and harmful. In a statement to CBC News, the American LGBTQ group Athlete Ally said the new policy will not be enforceable without seriously violating the privacy and human rights of any athlete. This move from the world of swimming comes as at least 18 U.S. states are taking steps to ban or limit transgender sports participation. Chris Glover, CBC News, Washington. More allegations are emerging that a former RCMP officer assaulted multiple teenagers while on the job. I never complained because I was told that I would be killed. We hear for the first time from some of the alleged victims. California's drought could affect more than just hot sauce. Some are pointing to a Canadian solution. And camps are about to start, but there's a catch. Staffing has been the single biggest challenge in the industry. We're back after this. Those are workers at an Apple store in Maryland uh, who voted nearly two to one to unionize this weekend. 
It makes it the first American Apple store to do that. Two months ago in New York, the first U.S. Amazon warehouse unionized, and in recent months, so have dozens of Starbucks in the U.S. Many kids are returning to summer camp this year for the first time since the pandemic began. After two years of restrictions, enrollment is high, but staffing shortages are threatening to spoil the fun. Jamie Strachan reports. The demand has been very high. We've had wait lists since November. With COVID restrictions easing, Howie Grossinger says parents are eager to get their children back outside. In less than two weeks, the owner of Camp Robin Hood hopes to welcome about 700 eager campers to the sprawling property just north of Toronto. 100% staffing has been the single biggest challenge in the industry. Grossinger says while camper enrollment is high, it's been hard for many camps across Canada to find staff. I'm probably looking to fill anywhere between 10 and 15 spots, which is not typical for this time of year for me. In Quebec, the municipality of La Peche told families it had to scrap all its summer camp programs. We receive on average every year about 60 uh, CVs. We've received 15 this year. In BC, the Provincial Camp Association says many of its members still need to fill about 50% of their positions. We don't have the adequate supervision to run this number of kids and, and we might have to turn people away, which is a heartbreak and we hate that. Uh, that's a, a camp director's worst nightmare. Thiessen says there's a number of factors. For one, COVID disrupted the in-house training many camps rely on to fill jobs. Suddenly we had a summer and a bit of no camp experience and you had this demographic of young adults who found other uh, opportunities. Yeah, so swim lessons are Grossinger says that more than ever he's Canadian working here. to attract and Canadians of different Canadian. backgrounds. Them being able to tell the story of their work experience to their parents so their parents can support this work experience because some parents who don't know what it's like to work at camp will say no I think you should work at the local big box or the mall. He and owners across the country are doing all they can to ensure they have the staff in place to make this summer special for kids. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, 16 years ago, a man came forward with allegations an RCMP officer had assaulted him. In a lot of ways, it has destroyed who I was or who I could have been. Today, more are speaking out. We investigate what the RCMP knew and what they did about it. Next. Welcome back. Tonight, a difficult but important and very personal story about allegations of sexual assault dating back decades, made by men and women who were teenagers at the time. Most didn't know each other, but all point fingers at the same man, a former Mountie. Paul Hunter began investigating more than 15 years ago. Tonight, some of those making the allegations will have their stories told publicly for the first time. There was never a moment that was anything that was less than sickening and frightening and disgusting to me through that whole period. Graham Wilson is effectively the reason this story is being told. This video is from 2007. We'd sat down with him because his godmother in British Columbia cold called me one day and said, can you talk to Graham? He's a mess. Graham then told me that when he was a teenager back in the 1980s, he'd been sexually assaulted, raped by a Mountie, though the accusation was unproven. Then Graham told me there were multiple other victims, but even then, 20 years later, nobody outside the police knew who they were or how to find them. It's only now that we can finally tell their stories. I was repeatedly assaulted and victimized and stalked by Constable Don Cook while he's wearing his RCMP uniform. Yeah, we're gonna hang a left here. Definitely Abbotsford was my home. Um, I, you know, played my hockey here and then of course Bob Callan is one of the other men and women yeah, now totally alleging old. sexual assaults by that mountain he took us to one of the places where he says it happened to him as a young teen 
a hockey rink in Abbotsford, BC. Don Cook, the Mountie, was also Callan's hockey coach. That's him on the right with Callan's team in 1985. Cook also coached this team with younger players, the team sponsored by the RCMP itself. It's been, been a long time and I don't think there's a day that goes by that you don't remember kind of things that have happened and things that uh, will never go away and you'll remember them for the rest of your life and they're not always the memories you want to listen to that's, or remember, that's for sure. Callan has described assaults in the showers in Cook's sports car at Cook's house. He has never before spoken publicly about any of it. He and others complained to police in the 2000s, but no charges followed. Fear of stigma kept him and others from speaking out publicly. Likewise, fear of retaliation. Did you complain at the time? I never complained because I was told that because of his position, because of his knowledge with policing, that I would be killed, I would be, I would vanish, I would be, nobody would ever find me. He told you that? Yes, he did. If I said anything to anybody. There's a hundred dollar bill on the counter. Back okay. in 2007, and, uh, it was Graham day, Wilson's call to CBC hard. that I led us eventually to Bob Callan, and Callan in turn want. led us eventually to it. another man, Tom Teeson, who, like Callan, is now speaking out, but asked that his face be hidden. Yeah, no, yeah, sorry, yeah, no. I'm, he told I'm us that as a 14-year-old, Cook you know, befriended, getting, groomed, then sexually assaulted wrestled, him. I mean, not wrestled, but held down and basically raped, right? And, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, it's very sickening. In fact, he says yeah. Cook befriended Teeson's whole family, so much that Teeson's parents put Cook's photo on the wall at the Teeson home where it hung for years. It sickened Tom, but he kept quiet as the alleged assaults continued, including, it's alleged, multiple times in this farmer's field near Tom's house while Cook was on duty. You're in his police cruiser? Yeah, always in his police cruiser. He's assaulting you in a police cruiser? Yeah, that's correct, several times. Although Cook was investigated but never charged, over the years and at different times, Wilson, Callan, Teeson, and a former teammate of Callan, Travis Pierce, each launched civil suits against Cook and the RCMP. Wilson told us he and his family complained about Cook in 1982, but police say they have no record of that. Teeson told us another RCMP constable, Cook's roommate, once found him in Cook's bed and did nothing. Two cops, two Mounties in the house, one of them is sleeping with a 14-year-old boy and the other one does nothing. Yeah, that's correct. A decade later, that other Mountie, a fellow coach with Cook on one of those hockey teams, pulled out his gun at an RCMP detachment on Vancouver Island, put it to his head and pulled the trigger. And now, from Newfoundland's South Shore, where Cook was transferred in 86, more allegations. Two women tell CBC News Cook cultivated malicious sexual relationships with each of them as teenagers. In a statement, one of them writes, he kept telling me to relax and trust him. One says he once locked her, terrified, in an RCMP holding cell. One voice missing in all of this is that of Don Cook, long gone from Abbotsford, having faced questions, lawsuits, and a criminal investigation. For years, he's been living a life, for the most part, quietly and far away in Ontario. To be clear, Don Cook has always denied sexual misconduct. 
In fact, in 2010, he sued the Mounties for wrongly investigating him, calling the RCMP strongly homophobic and said he now suffers depression and panic attacks from all the stress. The suit was settled privately. He said Bob Callan is angry and bitter because Cook once banned him from the hockey team and that Wilson once failed a lie detector test and is unreliable and his story untrue. We reached Cook by cell phone to offer up an on-camera interview. Uh, I'll speak to my lawyer. I think that would be appropriate. He'd be the one that would uh, respond. Cook's I mean, uh, lawyer later wrote to CBC underlining sure. Cook was investigated but never charged and that Cook, who's now retired, strenuously denies ever sexually assaulting anyone. Did he say anything at, at that? The point? RCMP declined comment on this story, but has long disputed liability. Last week, it entered into talks toward a settlement with Callan, Thiessen, and Pierce. Sad part is, you know, he'll always... Seems like he'll always have a small piece of you, you know. Sometimes that's hard to let go because you beat yourself up so much to think so many things of, you know, how you should have got out of it or what you should have done different or why were you in that position, you know, for him to be, you know, you, you to be so vulnerable. It makes me very angry that nobody listened and uh, that he's still out on the street and I believe he's probably still doing what he did to us and 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 you know every everybody has to pay and that the system didn't stop him when they when they should have if the RCMP settles it's all too late for Graham Wilson he abandoned his lawsuit years ago then effectively he disappeared off the grid until 2017, when someone found his body dead in a trailer in a homeless encampment. He'd overdosed on fentanyl. In a lot of ways, it has destroyed who I was or who I could have been. My capabilities, the things, I, my dreams, it destroyed all my dreams. Anything I wanted to do in my life, I never did. Out on the ice, Bob Callan every now and again still laces up and smashes that puck around. These days, it's with his grown son, both hardened by years of chasing justice and a system they say betrayed and failed those who spoke out. Callan's only goal now, he says, is simply for Canadians to know this story and learn from it. Paul, where does this story go next? Well, the short answer is that mediation that could result in a settlement is ongoing between those making the allegations and the RCMP. As ever, if there is a settlement reached, there would likely be a non-disclosure aspect to it, as is usual in such circumstances. Um, to be clear, Don Cook, the former Mountie, is not part of the mediation process. And again, to this day, he denies he's ever sexually assaulted anyone. All of this, Paul, has been playing out for years. Why has it taken so long? Allegations about crimes that happen behind closed doors or in other private places are complicated. And allegations about sexual assault and speaking publicly about them for obvious reasons are particularly difficult, especially so when the alleged incidents are decades old. These Lawsuits have been winding their way through the system for the better part of a dozen years. Those making the allegations have been slowed down by process, but they have never wavered in their determination to see this through. And while their names have been public at various times over the years because of court documents, it took them until now to speak out because it's hard to speak out about this. Graham, the first person in our story, did speak to us, of course, years ago, but at the time, he was the only one which makes our job complicated. As I say in the piece, we've now spoken directly with a number of others. Some are in our story, others are not. But only now 
are those who did speak out, able and willing to do this publicly, because they felt it important enough to go on the record and for others to hear their story. And so here we are. All right. Paul, thank you. You're welcome. After the break, California's drought is destroying crops, and it's having an impact on our grocery shelves. We'll look at the homegrown solutions and... Our ancestors used to live off this food, so it's just that much better, you know? A First Nations community goes back to its roots to tackle food security. That's next. Some California crops are getting destroyed by severe heat and drought. It's resulted in shortages here in Canada and has even forced a popular condiment out of production. Nayat Singh takes a look at that and how Canadian farmers could help. It's limiting the amount of ground that we can farm. It's, the amount, it's limiting the amount of the intensity that we can farm. California farmers are struggling in the third year of the worst drought on record, leading to water restrictions for farmers. The changing climate has caught up with the world-famous Sriracha hot sauce this summer. Haifong Foods, its producer in California, has suspended production after extreme heat and drought hit the hot pepper crops the company uses. For pepper and tomatoes, it's really more about heat stress. Uh, we get, you know, last week we had 100 and 103 degrees, so that's about 40, 41 degrees Celsius. And um, pollen does, you know, pollen basically aborts, uh, you know, at this stage, so you don't get fruit or flower set um, at these temperatures. Hot peppers have been affected along with other vegetables and grains. 20% of all of Canada's crop imports come from California, worth $2.8 billion in 2021. And crop failures there could lead to price hikes and empty shelves here. All this brings new urgency to helping Canadian farmers produce our food closer to home. We could rely on more Canadian crops um, and developing them more. I think we should definitely you know, seek out Canadian fruit and veg when we go to the, gro the grocery store. Ottawa farmer Heiko Kreigsman grows several varieties of hot peppers and makes a popular line of hot sauces. But he says investment is critical to boost production here. If there were ways that there was actually being invested in greenhouses, for example, here in Canada, you can actually get a lot of the vegetables that are now being grown in the southern parts of the world in this place as well. The drought in California shows the importance of local farms like Craigsman's to help keep Canada's food supply stable. In Ayat Singh, CBC News, Toronto. A former chef in Alberta is using food to connect students with their Indigenous identity. His pilot project brings meat from animals that have been hunted into the meal programs of schools on First Nations. Travis McEwen shows us the care that's being taken and the benefits this program brings to students. How many of you have skinned a bear before? Nobody? Close to 40 students watch as a black bear is skinned and butchered. It was killed the night before. And this meat will be used for sausage, a traditional food in their Cree culture. Come in close, you need to be watching. For the students, it's captivating, something many have never experienced. It's cool how they, they leave the paws there in the head, on the hide. Jason Big Charles is a land-based knowledge educator teaching the traditional ways to use indigenous foods, like dry meat in the smoker. It was cut thinly by the students and is slowly cooked over a fire. We've slowly been losing that, that sustainability and that uh, food security as we've been colonized and, and westernized. So now we're, we rely on the grocery store. And this is the heart and the tongue. In a nearby tent, harvested meat is then cooked up for lunch and dinner. A shift from the processed foods Clifford Gladue saw dominating the diets of students. I became diabetic. So I wanted to make a change in the community. So that's why I started planning to get rid of processed foods and I wanted to bring in more healthy options for our students. Gladue soon discovered many kids at the schools hadn't had moose meat and traditional foods once his elders ate as they lived off the land and didn't rely on the grocery store. That's pretty shocking. To me, like me, right, I never had so much traditional foods when I was younger because I lost that identity, right? And I wanted to, I didn't want the students to lose that. 
His solution includes taking meat killed by indigenous hunters and getting it into schools and having it prepared in traditional ways for students at least once a month. It took a lot of effort for Gladue to get the traditional foods pilot up and running for the past two years. Prior to that, there was nine months of consulting, which included elders, provincial and federal dietitians, environment safety officers, and even fish and wildlife. It's not as simple as a hunter shooting an animal and just bringing it into the school. It needs to be hunted on traditional lands. Hunters and cooks need to fill out forms. Meats need to be bagged and labeled. All the paperwork is sent to Indigenous Services Canada to be logged. Ladu even learned how to inspect the meat so that samples aren't needed. Students have a say in, in what they want. You know. Jaleel Whitehead is the junior chief of Little Buffalo School, around 450 kilometers northwest of Edmonton. He appreciates the efforts to get students eating foods like moose meat, as he considers it comforting. You acknowledge the fact that our ancestors used to live off this food, so it's just that much better, you know. Ladu is proud of the work he and others have done to get to this point, but it may also benefit other First Nations students as well. I'm kind of speechless, like, because we, we are leading the way to bring all this back. It's been tough to get the program started, but Gladu says it's been worth it when he sees students connecting over traditional food just as their elders did before them. Travis McEwen, CBC News, near Little Buffalo. After six decades of arts and advocacy, Buffy St. Marie shows no signs of slowing down. Tomorrow on The National, she chats with Adrian about atrocities against Indigenous peoples, the Pope's upcoming apology tour, and her life as an entertainer and activist. Watching other interviews you have given over the years, as a journalist, I find it really uncomfortable because I can see you being open and being strong, and yet I, sometimes I see a bit of a dismissal or not really hearing mm -hmm. you. The little Indian girl must be mistaken. I kind of. Yeah. Yeah, well, she's nice and she's cute. We like her. Right. But she's really mistaken. She, it can't be true. Dear God, tell me that doesn't still happen to you. Of course it happens all the time. It happens every day about a lot of things. You can see the full interview tomorrow on The National, and you can dig deeper into the life and legacy of Buffy St. Marie in a new CBC podcast, Buffy. It premieres tomorrow on National Indigenous Peoples Day. You can hear it on the free CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. Next, a father of seven whose talent broke ceilings in Canadian sports. I'm going to quit soccer and take care of my family. Why we're honoring retired soccer player Terry Felix next in our moment. Well, here's a look at the Vancouver Whitecaps from back in the 1980s. And on that team, Terry Felix, Canada's first Indigenous soccer player to go pro. Tonight, Terry was honoured at the Inspire Awards. But the dad of seven was not just recognised for what he did on the field. It's the decision he made off of it that made it a moment fit for Father's Day. I never told my kids what I did, and they never really felt the impact of it growing up. We weren't allowed to play in non-native soccer leagues. But there was one tournament in Chilliwack that allowed us to enter. And then I started for the Vancouver Whitecaps. I was ready to join the national team. We were going to the Olympics. At the same time, my daughter was going to be born. I thought, I'm going to quit soccer and take care of my family. I quit that day when I was 24. I got seven kids. To my dad, Terry Felix, today I am a proud son. What you've achieved and you've accomplished in your lifetime is truly amazing. Dad, I am so proud of you. Thank you so much for being such a great, wonderful father. I decided my family over soccer, and soccer's gone, and my family is still here. So I made a really good decision. There have been a lot of great tributes to fathers on social media throughout the day, and then that one uh, so nice as well. Having moved here after the Whitecaps in the, I guess, 70s and 80s in the North American Soccer League, I've heard a lot about the team, but never heard about him until tonight. That is The National for June 19th. Good night. <laughs>